I think we should just get it kicked off because we have a really busy day ahead of us in one hour. So thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our Power PropTech Demos and Discussions event. My name is Julia Chellaru and I'm a co-founder of PropTech Collective and the Regional Director of LMRE Canada, a specialist real estate and PropTech recruitment agency. For those joining us for the first time, PropTech Collective is a not-for-profit organization aimed at strengthening the PropTech community in Canada by bridging the information, diversity, and knowledge gaps between the real estate and technology industries. Through our platform, we aim to create opportunities for emerging and diverse leaders across the real estate and technology sectors. To date, we've been able to organize close to 20 events, bringing together over 1,500 guests to learn and network. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to our amazing committee of volunteers and our program partners for their financial and in-kind support. Jumping specifically into the logistics for the event today, we'll have an exciting round of demos and discussions where rising energy prop tech companies, Switch, Peak Power, and Parity will showcase their solutions to established real estate leaders. And we'll have a discussion on how we can expedite the adoption of energy related technologies in real estate. Our lovely host, Old Dutch Buku, is going to help frame our event, and then we'll dive deep into the demos. Um, after the demos, Olta will be moderating a discussion with our panelists, joining us from Boma Canada, Kingset Capital, and Dream. So please note that this event will be recorded. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Olta. Olta started her sustainability journey about 15 years ago, supporting the implementation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement in Western Balkans to develop and implement the low emission strategies in the energy and transportation space to build resilience to climate change. Olta joined AMP Energy eight years ago and led the development of the largest distributed generation project in North America, deploying solar across 400 schools in Ontario. She drafted the strategy for AMP to enter the digital energy space, materializing in the creation of AMPX, a digital energy platform. She currently spearheads the development of new products and new market strategies in her role as of Senior Director and Strategy and Head of Sustainability. Passing it over, Olta, to you to help frame today's topic. Thank you very much, Julia. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us. We are here today because of our joint passion on sustainability and technology. In this session, hopefully the first of many to come, we will explore the untapped path to sustainability through digitization. Climate change and sustainability are finally taking center stage in the global agenda. In the graph that you can see, it is unfortunate that the path to meeting the Paris Agreement seems quite daunting, maybe because we're quite late to the game. But we are very optimistic that we are going to be able to meet those targets through the net zero commitments that a lot of other, maybe next slide, uh, next slide, uh, Julia, sorry. In the next slide, we see that we're going to be able to meet this agreement through the net zero uh, commitments targets that a lot of other organizations have committed to. In the past year alone, we have seen that a doubling of net zero commitments to this organization, which has translated into tremendous opportunities, both through uh, stimulus packages given through the government or commitments from asset managers in the space. Corp uh, significant efforts are required to meet these goals and accelerated change is coming. Net zero commitments started from leading companies, some of which we will have in our panel today, who passionately work to bring sustainability in their industry. It's through their work that the net zero bug, so to speak, became contagious and commitments almost doubled in the last year alone. The future seems optimistic through the work of these uh, individuals and focusing on buildings is paramount. In the next slide, we will see that regardless of how we slice the CO2 emission sectors of CO2 emissions globally, buildings play a very important role in becoming part of the solution because they, as we can see, they're a huge part of the problem. Right now, they represent 28% of global emissions globally alone just from their operation. But if we add to that uh, materials and uh, sort, uh, construction, we go to almost 40%. And making them part of the solution is extremely important. Digitalization, as we can see in the next slide, can play a key role in translating the uh, buildings being a problem to being an opportunity. And they can play a very important role to the pathway to sustainability. 
I have had the pleasure of working with some of the companies, the prop tech companies, which we'll have the pleasure to hear today and give us their, uh, uh, their demonstrations. And I've seen the tremendous progress that they have made in supporting sustainability through digitization. I look very much forward to listening to their pitches and asking questions at the end. I thank you very much for your time in joining us today. Back to you, Julia, for some housekeeping rules and introducing us to the PropTech company. Thank you, Olta. So now I'm going to welcome these startups to the stage. So each company will have four minutes to introduce their companies, followed by four minutes of questions from our real estate experts who represent existing or potential customers. So our awesome panel uh, providing feedback today is comprised of Hazel Sutton. She's the Director of Env Environmental Standards at BOMA Canada. Joe Brown, Director of the Building Technology at Kingstead Capital, and Lee Hodgingson, VP of Technical Services at DREAM. Thanks all for joining us today. So we will also uh, be sharing a link to a survey in the chat, and this is uh, mainly for the audience in the room. Please open it up, and as we will go through the demos, please jot down any feedback or que questions that you have for the companies. This is just extraordinarily helpful for the companies, and all feedback will be aggregated and shared anonymously. If you're interested in learning more uh, and, or about the solution or think the solution might be a fit for your company, you can also opt in for an intro. We will only pass along the contact information if you authorize us to do so. So first off, uh, I'd like to kick it off with uh, and invite Carter Lee, the CEO of Switch, to kick us off. Remember, you'll get a message when you're at 10 seconds left. So good luck. Thanks, Julia. Hello, everyone. I'm Carter Lee, CEO of Switch. And at Switch, we're making it easier for everyone to drive electric. We're also helping real estate developers and utilities capture the massive opportunity from growing electric vehicle adoption. Next slide. Electric vehicles are leading the way to a cleaner future, but there's a problem. A lot of EV owners live in multifamily buildings, such as condominiums and apartments where they don't have access to charging. Currently, 25% of EV owners don't have access to charging, and by 2022, there's going to be over 5 million. It's a challenge we're seeing mirrored across the world from Toronto to New York to Shanghai. Next slide. To address the unique challenges of urban electric vehicle ownership, we've built an EV charging platform designed specifically for these high density multi tenant settings, such as uh, office buildings, retail locations, as well as multifamily buildings. Next slide. Over 85% of EV charging occurs either at home or at work in buildings. Think about your cell phone and where you charge it the most often, usually at home when you go to bed. Similarly, EV charging occurs mostly in homes overnight. Unlike e other EV charging networks who are focused on providing public charging infrastructure, Switch is focused on providing private charging infrastructure in homes and workplaces where charging occurs the most. Next slide. So what's the result? Well, everyone wins. The EV owners get charging access when and where they need it most. Building owners increase property values, gain new revenue streams, and utilities maximize load growth while minimizing the need to upgrade costly infrastructure. Next slide. We're fully commercialized with over 600 charging stations across North America. Since 20, 2018, we've generated over 3 million in commercial sales and have grown our sales pipeline to 5 million. Next slide. We've also secured over $5 million in R&D projects in real, with real estate engineering and energy utility partners to demonstrate our EV charging and energy management platform insights across Ontario using vehicle to grid, blockchain, and distributed energy resource aggregation technologies. Next slide. We're moving into an age where buildings produce and consume their own electricity, where uh, electric vehicles charge and discharge energy to support the buildings and the grid, and where blockchain uh, platforms enable distributed energy resource aggregation platforms and economies. Switch is leading the way to helping real estate developers capture these massive opportunities and realizing the vision of EVs becoming an integral part of the smart building and smart grid ecosystems. Next slide. Widespread EV adoption is, is becoming a, a fact and a reality, and there's enormous opportunity to address challenges of urban electric vehicle ownership for those living in multifamily buildings around the world. We're excited to play a part in solving this challenge for the cities of tomorrow. Thanks.
Thank you, Carter. Applause. Sorry that it's uh, still virtual. If this was a room, we'd see this, but thanks very much for, for giving us the overview. So now jumping into the Q&A portion, I'd love to invite, you know, um, uh, Lee, do you have any feedback, any questions for, for Carter? And then we can go around the, the panelists and also answer any questions we might have from the audience. So please feel free to drop them in the chat. Yeah, I'm um, happy to kick this off. And uh, um, you know, Carter, that was great. Um, very succinct and, you know, I, I think I understand kind of what you're getting at. I do have a couple questions though. Um, and, and I'm not sure how much business model versus like technology side we want to talk about, but, you know, I'll let you kind of steer that, but, you know, one, one question I kind of have is like, how much of the cost of using your EV chargers do you pass to the users to the consumer versus is this meant to be an amenity for a building? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, we, we like to break it down into kind of two models. There's one that's like a private deeded model where individuals own their charging stations in their own parking stalls. So that's more of a condominium model. And then the other one is a community shared model, which applies primarily to rental apartments, but you can have that in the condos as well, um, where that's more of an amenity to, uh, to, to, to the tenants and the residents of the building. So, so you know, the usually the ownership belongs to the private residents in condominium settings, but for like say offices or, you know, like rental apartments, that's more of an amenity perspective. And that's the cost is kind of taken from the and, property. And so the reason I ask that is from an, uh, an office building's perspective, especially, but even a um, apartment building potentially as well, you know, we're very concerned about demand charges that come through on our utility bill. And so like, you know, today, if I only have like 10 EV chargers in my garage, um, the EV component of my, you know, energy usage pie is actually really small, right? Um, but uh, as that grows, you know, it turns into 100 EV chargers and things like that, and everybody's showing up at 9 a.m. or whatever at the office building, um, that actually increases our demand charge a lot, which isn't typically very easy to quantify as like a dollar per hour or whatever. How, how are you planning on dealing with that out of curiosity? Yeah, and I think that's that's uh, probably one of the main things that we focus on in addressing because that is a very specific, you know, like applies to all settings, but very pertinent for large buildings, right? You know, for global adjustment, for demand response programs, that sort of thing. So for us, it's really about getting the full charge within that time, what we call dwell time. So if you're at the office, it's usually nine to five. So by the time you leave the office, your charging charging is completed. So because there's a, there's a significant window to achieve that objective, we, that's where kind of where our machine learning and our AI kind of kicks in and understanding how many people are plugging in, how many people need to achieve a charge given a certain time of day, and how do we smooth that out essentially and she, like shave the peaks you know, to a later period instead of everybody getting like full load like at 9.30 p.m. a.m. because that's where everybody plugs in. And then you have no one being used, like none of the chargers being used at 3 or 4 p.m. because they're all full essentially. So that's a very important element and that's something that we focus on addressing in, in terms of our platform and technology. Great, um, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, Joe, do you have any questions? Otherwise, we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I was just going to, it's a comparable or a similar question to the last one, but it's just, I guess there's a lot of competing interests for electricity in, in existing buildings and in new builds. Um, with the trend towards electrification and whatnot, uh, how do you how do you balance everything? There's only only so much power feeding into a building. And if I was to go around and put uh, charging stations at every uh, every spot, as well as uh, you know, rip up my boiler and put in uh, some heat pumps, I'm going to run out of uh, pieces of the pie very quickly. Um, I guess you've addressed a bit of it with AI, but but are you seeing limitations with what you can do in existing buildings and, and even in new build? Um, I, I can only bring in so much feed based on existing use and and not necessarily size for the future and and to take that financial hit up front uh, with the expectation that maybe someday we'll get there. Um, so how, what are you seeing in the industry with this and, and how do you, how have you dealt with it? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, you know, that's a part of something that we, we really, uh, really value as well in providing a holistic um, like kind of approach to energy management because, you know, electric vehicle charging is a significant profile within the building, but it's certainly not 
the profile and there are many other large pro energy consuming profiles in that building, HVACs, lighting, et cetera. So for us, uh, trying to integrate uh, into the kind of the holistic picture is about being able to plug and play into as many building energy management systems as possible to become a piece of that puzzle and not like an independent vertical that you cannot manage. So this is when we had a, I had a brief slide showing kind of like our partners, you know, we're working with groups like One Valet, working with groups like, you know, um, uh, Locomobi. These are all groups that are building around technology within the buildings that manage energy, that manage, you know, user experience. So for us, trying to plug in and hope like working with groups potentially with like someone like parity or you know peak power these are all groups that we feel that will combine will provide a holistic solution to energy management within the system and for us it's really important to be as plug and playable as possible in in that scenario thanks carter and i guess also to to involve the audience here because there's lots of questions so starting off with david's uh, question has the condo act and the oeb set new regulations regarding the the rates and i guess to build upon it also tushar was looking uh, if if there's any regulatory hiccups i guess from cities or municipalities regarding implementing the ev charger yeah, there's been, uh, you know, change back and forth uh, in terms of the building code that was initially implemented in 2018 that kind of got pulled back a little bit. So in terms of existing, current existing um, building code in, in Ontario, it's primarily to the Toronto Green Standard version three that requires an EV readiness component to, to new buildings. But there's also like a right to charge legislation where the, if the resident of a condominium wants to pay for their infrastructure, they're allowed the, 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 the condo board and the property management needs to address and provide a solution as long as they're willing to pay for it, being the resident itself. So that, those are the kind of like uh, current regulations in place. They're quickly evolving. I heard that the Toronto Green Center version four, uh, which will probably be for buildings being completed in 2016, 2017, is going to be probably closer to 100% EV readiness. So that'll be particularly challenging for for that kind of infrastructure requirement, but you know, uh, these are all kind of fast evolving um, regulations. Thank you, Carter, and thanks for your time. I think in the interest of time and getting to the second demo, we'd love to pass it on um, to Phil at Peak Power to take us away. I think you're still on mute if you're speaking. <laughs> Everybody, I'm uh, Phil from Peak Power. Thank you, uh, Julia, for the introduction. I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability and Business Solutions. Next slide, please. So Peak Power is predominantly a, a software technology provider. Um, and we really tasked ourselves with, you know, going after the, the most difficult problems in the built environment and the energy markets. Uh, we're based out of Toronto, New York, Boston. Um, and we, our expertise mainly is in energy buildings and software. Uh, we've received grants from the Canadian federal and Ontario provincial governments to commercialize innovative green technologies. Um, our lead investor is Osmington, who is uh, the chairman of Thomson Reuters, David Thompson. Uh, we just recently completed a series A round for $12 million. And we've actually, one of the things, one of the images that you can see, we have the smart optimization in terms of the building. You have a battery installed close to a building, and then you have bi-directional EV chargers. Peak Power is actually the first company in the world to do a multi-asset load curtailment. What that means is we took eight separate buildings, four of those buildings had a battery, two of the building had a total of 12 EV cars that are bi-directional where we can not only charge the car, but we can pull the charge from the car to offset building load. And the final two buildings were a manual load curtailment. Um, the entire thing was orchestrated by our software and it was uh, yeah, the first in the world. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what I'm gonna focus on today a little bit more I'm not going to speak so much about the batteries or the EVs, but more about, uh, you know, I'm going to focus on decarbonization a little bit and what we at Peak Power are doing. I mean, we have our Building Insight platform, which is an IoT-based platform that we are installing in, you know, within about a day or so. Um, it's available on smartphone as well as desktop as well. And it's a real-time energy management platform with predictive analytics and alerts. So what that means is we are monitoring in real time the occupancy, real time occupancy of the building, power consumption, temperature, humidity of the building. Um, and we are load forecasting what the building is going to consume within the next 48 hours in the future. Based on that load prediction, we're actually sending the building operator 
specific and targeted alerts on what they can do to reduce consumption and become more efficient. Um, I, the, one of the biggest value adds of this is that they don't have to be monitoring the platform continuously to derive value from the platform. We're doing it in the background for them. Essentially, it's continuous commissioning or ongoing commissioning. We're watching out in the background, making sure if there's any anomalies, we flag it, our software flags it and notifies the building operator immediately. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And I mean, one of the, the greatest part about it is that it's, it's secure, it's scalable and can be set up in a day. It sits on our own Wi-Fi network. Um, all the IoT sensors are battery operated. They're all wireless. Uh, we take care of all the, the maintenance of the batteries and the sensors themselves. And actually lately, um, it, we added an additional IAQ platform onto the module where um, we can also monitor using wireless sensors. We can monitor CO2, CO, TVOCs, um, and PM 2.5 as well, because we know that air quality has become pretty predominant in the overall management, energy performance management of the built environment. Next slide, please. Quick little case study. Um, this building is one of our first deployments in Midtown Toronto. It's a 50 plus year old building, um, mainly commercial office. It is 260,000 square feet. Within the first 11 months of deploying the Building Insight platform, um, they had realized a $65,000 um, savings, which amounted to about 12% of overall reduced energy consumption and a 230% overall ROI, along with 18.5 tons of carbon offset. Next slide, please. So, I mean, for us, what's next, we're gonna to continue to focus on two things, distributed energy resources, using the batteries, the EVs, also buildings, um, with a very large underlying focus on ESG and a strategy for decarbonization, as well as continuous tracking for uh, carbon offsets for our clients. Um, essentially helping our clients create that ESG framework, um, implement the technologies to achieve their goals, and then track those goals with reporting from our platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, that was great. And again, opening it up uh, to our panelists and also questions from the audience. How about we start off with Hazel? Well, any feedback to share? Absolutely, thank you so much for that, Phil. Um, I was wondering as I was listening, uh, so COVID-19 creates some really uh, different operating paradigms for our buildings, especially during lockdown situations where the occupant density dropped. And I was wondering how does a platform like Building Insights platform help um, optimize energy performance or energy consumption in those weird different operating paradigms? You know, Hazel, that's a fantastic question. I think one of the things that we've noticed the most is that you know, a few years ago, building operators and building managers were able to predict the number of occupants in their building on a specific day, whether it's a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, they, they knew pretty much how many people were going to be in that building based on, um, you know, based on experience. That is gone. I mean, nowadays, a building operator might have 50 people in their building, and the next day it could be 150, and the next day it could be 20. Um, it's very hard to run a building when you don't know who's going to be coming to work uh, or how many people are going to be occupying a specific space. Um, so that's one of the things where our platform has actually been most advantageous, where we have the occupancy, they can see how many people are in the building, where they are in the building, essentially, and then they can deploy, um, they can deploy their, um, their HVAC or their chillers, uh, their, their manual HVAC equipment, according to how many people are in the building. So it's been pretty good to know how many people are in the building now versus before. Thank you. Thanks. And then, uh, Joe, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, I think, um, no, I, I've got nothing at this time. Thanks. No, that's totally fine. We have David actually in the audience that was, uh, had a question. So what EV companies allow you to use the battery bi-directionally? Yeah, there's, there's only a couple of suppliers. Um, right now we're using the Nissan Leaf. That's the one that we're deploying. Nice. Nice. Thanks, Phil. And then, um, uh, anyone else in the audience have any questions that they would like to put? I have another question, if I may, uh, about the uh, the peak drive. Actually, um, what does a conversation look like with uh, occup or sorry, with actual electric car drivers about discharging or the bi-directional piece and and taking energy electricity from their car from their charge? Is there a is that a difficult conversation to have? Do they get on board? Is there an incentive that's given? 
it, it's a good question, honestly. I mean, it's the conversation really goes where the first thing we tell them is we will never, we will never not give you enough charge to get home. That's that's the first conversation because obviously the cars have to be in, you know, they have to be charging and connected for us to, to complete the battery at that specific time. Um, so that's the one thing that is, is the main concern. They're like, as long as I have enough power to get home, I'm good. I'm okay with it. These events don't typically happen on a daily basis. Uh, we usually do get some notice, so they get plenty of notice as well. Um, so I think that's that's the main concern that we usually alleviate. That no matter what, we will never deplete the entire battery where it doesn't have time to recharge or give them enough charge to get home. Great, thanks, Hazel. And Lee, do you, uh, I saw you unmute. Did you have a question as well, or? Um, yeah, I mean, great, uh, great discussion, Phil. Um, and you know, full disclosure, we have some Peak Drive um, cars in Dreams buildings, and we were part of that pilot, and, and uh, we considered a success. Um, I, I think what was interesting from our experience was the timing of the pandemic and the effect of that on the business model around peak drive, right? Which is if people are actually just staying home instead of coming to the office every day, um, that materially affects that. You know, we're going, we're going to be going into a period of time where, uh, which is what's called transitionary, where people are at home in the office and, you know, maybe it's a month at home and a month in the office or whatever that looks like for people. How will that program adapt based on those changing kind of conditions? And, and how does that affect, you know, the goals of, you know, kind of decarbonizing, right? You know what, it's a fantastic question, Lee. And in all honesty, we're not really sure. Um, it's one of those things where we're just gonna have, kind of have to wait and see what happens with the market. I mean, one of the things that we all know specifically in the industry is that the ICI program, which is a main leading factor in this overall program and the ability to reduce global adjustment charges on a utility bill for a commercial office space such as yours, um, you know, that, that program was kind of put on hold for a year or so until we see what happens. So I think it, it definitely will be predicated on a uh, return to office, even though, even if it's a half return or, or a certain percentage, even if we don't get to the, to the levels that they were before, I think that's okay. That, that's completely fine. There would still be a use case for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely seeing that presence and that workforce going back to the commercial office space, um, I think that would be... Um, uh, one of the factors that would have to be predicated on, on, um, on our future. Yeah, just more unknowns in the future. And, and even though I'm a big fan of, of uh, the pilot so far, you know, I'm not going to take it easy on you guys. You got you know, every day. We all got to uh, challenge ourselves. That's for sure. So that's a great answer. So thank that's you. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, new challenge and that's good. I mean, the best part about one of the platforms is that in, in times of uncertainty like this, that's where you get that, um, you know, you get large uncertainty. If your occupancy is down 80%, but your consumption is only down 20%, there's an issue there. And that's exactly the type of thing that our system has been picking up and notifying building operators of where, you know, you, your occupants is really, really down and still running quite high. So we send recommendations and alerts on how they can become more efficient. So um, I hope you don't let up, Lee. I appreciate that. <laughs> And on that point, we actually, Courtney uh, Cooper had a question uh, around the communication with attendants. So wh what are the landlords asking you to help them help? What are the landlords asking you to help them communicate to their tenants? So how much um, are the tenants and individuals uh, in the building curious about the energy data and the use of, um, of energy within the building? So for the first part of the question, I think that was more about the communication. So we essentially... In the beginning, we were do really doing the communication. We were just asking for the authority to go and speak to some of the tenants on site from management. Um, and we would explain the program, give them brochures and marketing material about how it would work. And we were basically subsidizing the lease of the vehicles, installing a charger at their home, as well as, you know, obviously at the at the office. Um, so for them, it, it was it was great. I mean, they were securing a parking spot downtown, they're getting a subsidized lease, they were getting a charger installed at their home. And this was one big pilot program that we're, you know, hoping to commercialize in the future. Um, so for them, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic deal. Um, and then the, the second part of the question, can you repeat that one? I didn't, I didn't get that, the second part. Sorry, just seeing if I'm mute. Uh, so how much, I guess the curiosity is from the tenant side, how much information uh, are tenants or individuals in the, uh, the building curious about the energy uh, consumption of the building? So are you seeing demand from tenants to also get access to, to the data that comes out of peak power? 
More and more so, yes. Um, and that's something that we leave to building management. Um, we definitely make that available to tenants as well. We can create separate modules specifically for a tenant space. The only thing we need to make sure is that we have our equipment in that space so we can properly allocate what that one space for a tenant is consuming rather than the rest of the building. Um, but as, as tenants become more and more curious and as even green building certifications, we're seeing even a shift from overall building certifications to tenant certifications. Uh, and tenants are noticing and they're, and they're participating more in these certifications. Part of those certifications is knowing what you consume as a tenant. Um, and that's where, you know, technology such as ours can really come into play and be advantageous. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much for, for the overview. So uh, in the interest of time, let's let's move to last but not least. We'd like to invite Alexandra Zakreski, who's the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Parity, uh, to take us away and do the demo. Hi, thanks, guys. Um, and thanks to PropTech Collective for inviting Parity to participate today. It's great to be amongst such an awesome group of, of startups in the energy space tackling the real estate market. Um, so really what Parity's solution provides is intelligent and real-time energy management. So we leverage machine learning and AI to achieve constant commissioning for multifamily HVAC systems. And we're very specifically focused on the multifamily market for a couple of reasons. Um, but before I launch into a description of our solution and an explanation of the value proposition, I really wanna just spend a moment talking about some of the problems that we're actually solving with our product. Um, so next slide. Um, so there's a couple of different sort of factors at play here. So, you know, the pandemic has put a ton of cost pressure on owners as vacancy rates for rental have hit record highs in the GTA and across the country. This has been coupled by a number of different sort of behavioral changes. So people are working from home, therefore consuming more energy and in less predictability in terms of consumption patterns, which leaves owners in a really challenging position of trying to extract more value from the asset and lower costs in a way that is also low capital intensive. Um, energy obviously represents a huge chunk of, our, of operating costs. Um, and HVAC tends to be around 40% of that. So there's a huge opportunity there for both uh, cost savings and efficiency. You know, we already spoke about the impact of buildings on the emissions profile. Um, they contribute a significant chunk of global carbon emissions. And in a lot of jurisdictions, local governments are becoming wise to this and introducing regulations that not only incentivize efficiency, but that also penalize owners that don't actually make progress on reducing emissions. Um, so, you know, Washington, D.C. is one example and, and New York City is another. We're growing rapidly in New York right now and have an office there as well. Um, and in Toronto, there isn't yet a legislation like that, but some of the benchmarking and reporting requirements do suggest that something similar could be coming down the pipe. Uh, finally, multifamily, you know, tends to suffer from thin margins and technology has naturally been very slow to penetrate the market. Um, these buildings tend to be under-resourced on the energy management side, and this is really where parity solution comes in, sort of at the convergence of those three factors. Um, we drive innovations in building automation, specifically around HVAC processes. Uh, to help owners and asset managers reduce their costs and decrease their CO2 emissions, um, while also serving as that virtual energy manager. On to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so in short, uh, our solution uses enhanced machine learning algorithms and, and um, AI sort of based logic to drive efficiency and optimize HVAC processes. So we do this by leveraging non-proprietary off-the-shelf hardware. Um, we don't have anything sort of that's our own special sauce except for in the software. Um, so we'll layer over top of the BAS system to actually drive better sort of logic and, and set points and motor run speeds. Um, to draw on an analogy, most current building HVAC systems are a bit like a team without a coach. Um, it works, but it certainly doesn't work to its full potential. Um, our software really represents that coach. So we provide enhanced logic and direction for components of the mechanical system so that the ownership groups and the asset managers can get the most efficient outcomes and performance. Um, so we ingest real-time data on a number of different sort of factors and variables, but predictive weather, occupancy, demand from residents. And we use that to sort of constantly train our models so that we communicate new motor speeds and set points every one to five minutes. Uh, we actually guarantee the savings that we project out of our customers so that we can ensure that they're being made whole on their investment um, and we make sustainability profitable in doing so. Uh, our payback periods typically range between one and three years. Uh, we have uh, over 120 buildings under management so far, have saved our customers a ton of money, are working with some incredible partners on both sort of the commercial scale and the pilot side um, and reduce a significant chunk of CO2 as well. Um, one last thing that I'll say about sort of the value props, or I can just go back to the other slide, um, is that uh, we're providing building owners and managers transparency. So we provide them with real-time visibility and fault detection on their HVAC system, which actually means that we can alert them to issues with the system before residents even become wise to the impact. 
sorry, now you can move on to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to kind of give you some insight into what our actual user interface and experience looks like. So um, any user, so that could be, you know, either a property manager in a condo, or it could be um, an energy manager at a REIT or a real estate ownership group can log into the platform and see, you know, either one building that we're managing or their entire portfolio of buildings um, and kind of hover over and look at a number of different data points. From there, you can navigate the individual buildings and you can see here one some of the different sort of metrics that we're tracking on. So you can see how you're progressing against the annual savings guarantee and, and the target, um, how much you've saved that calendar month. This is weather adjusted savings. Um, and that's a process breakdown between electricity and gas. And then there's additional sort of more granular data on the mechanical system. Um, you can also access data on the environmental impact. So how much, how many um, CO2 emissions you've prevented um, from releasing into the atmosphere, obviously. This can be really useful for ESG reporting and communicating with um, company stakeholders, et cetera. And then on the alerting side, if you want to just navigate over to the next slide, um, this kind of speaks more to what I was talking about in terms of diagnosing failures. Um, so we have sort of an inbuilt autonomous system whereby if we notice equipment functioning outside of its typical operating conditions, we notify site staff and also notify our on-call team internally. Um, so not only does that provide you with more timely notification of potential issues in the building, um, but it also allows our on-call team to support with remote resets and other sort of troubleshooting measures, which means that oftentimes you can avoid making calls to mechanical contractors and therefore saving additional money. Um, that's all I've got from a, a demo perspective. And I think I'm probably running up against time. Um, but yeah, thank you and, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Alex. I was like, should I play the sound? But no, thank you for <laughs> doing this. So uh, any questions from, from our panel? Maybe I'll start off with, um, with uh, Joe this time around, and then we can go. I see a lot of audience questions as well. Sure. Um, yeah, my my question is, and you alluded to this, that there's a thin margins in, in residential. Um, there's a lot of different tech that's being pitched at residential companies uh, right now. How how do you sell yourself over tenant uh, communications apps and and all all the other things that are out there um, when when we're trying to when you're trying to get capital? And and on the flip side of that, also, how well do you play with those other? Um, semi-overlapping technologies uh, where, where maybe um, we want to be able to communicate through a single platform to the operate, building operations uh, managers. Do you, do you integrate well with, with others when necessary? Yeah, so, so the question on integration, um, it, it's something that we're certainly exploring because yeah, that's every ownership group wants a, a single pane of glass where they can, you know, view all their mechanical systems and also sort of, sort of communicate with property managers. Um, we are not there yet. Um, but it's certainly on our product roadmap. Um, and we've already been exploring some, a number of different sort of like smaller integration with ancillary and value added service providers. So, you know, if you're thinking about, um, we actually just recently announced a partnership with Ecobee. So that's providing us with more sort of suite level data that we're able to, you know, then use to better train our models. Um, it better helps us optimize for resident comfort. Um, but we're also actively exploring partnerships with other providers and sort of the smart solution space. Um, when I think about sort of our, our grand product vision, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to integrate with companies that do sort of that, that property management piece on the digital side. So companies like Yoohoo and, and others like that, um, so that there's really that one sort of view where, where property managers can access all the information that they need. Um, there's a first part of your question and it was around how we sort of differentiate ourselves um, from other solutions providers um, when it comes to sort of selling, I guess. Um, I mean, the discernible ROI is, is the best part of it, right? So we, we guarantee the savings. Um, it's very low cost and, and low capital intensive. Um, and the payback periods are so low um, that it just, it makes it a really compelling solution and, and sort of taking that additional piece off of site staff and, and property managers plate from a mechanical system maintenance and transparency piece. Um, it just, it really resonates well with customers. Thanks, Joe. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, so Pietro is very, very engaged. Hi, Pietro. Nice to see you again. Um, I guess his first question is just more around uh, understanding how how do you actually go about to understand like which buildings have the right, I guess, technology in place in order for parity to work. Yeah, totally. So, so that's a really good question. And to be honest with you, we work with buildings totally across uh, the spectrum from a sophistication point of view. So, you know, um, we have a partnership with Starlight. They're one of our commercial scale rollout partners. Um, they have, you know, um, a great, you know, sort of up to spec VAS system that we've been able to do a really co low cost um, supervisor integration with. 
Um, so we have, you know, a certain sort of like list of like a wish list of, of the best BIS systems that provide like the lowest cost, easiest integration. Um, and that's kind of assessed in the initial sort of site assessment phase and, and by our engineering team. Um, but we also work with a number of condominiums and most of them do not have existing building automation systems. So we can actually provide like a full turnkey installation in those cases where, you know, we support them with the installation of the BAS system. They can either purchase it up front or, or finance it over time. Um, and then the savings go towards paying back, um, you know, paying for the asset over time as well. Thanks, Alex. And a couple more questions around, uh, I guess, the guarantee piece. So uh, going to David, uh, how is your guarantee take into account any changes in occupancy when they when people will will return from the work from home kind of environment that we're in right now? And then I'll ask uh, Pietro's question after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the guarantee, so how we kind of tabulate the guarantee is based on a couple of things. So there's a, a site assessment, um, either in person or done sort of virtually by logging into the existing BAS system that might be on site. Um, but we also look at two years of historical utility data and not all of that is going to be COVID. So, um, so using that sort of long time horizon from a, from a data perspective allows us to, you know, moderate the guarantee and, and ensure that it's realistic and then conservative enough while also being ambitious that we're able to deliver value for our clients. Great. And then uh, Pietro's second question also around uh, the business model for your clients. Is it uh, specifically, is the guarantee a savings cost sharing? Is there a minimum performance? Is it a flat fee? How exactly is that structured? Yeah, so, so it's structured as like a software as a service fee. Um, and the way that we determine that fee is that we, you know, we project out how much we believe we can save. And then we take 25% of that. Um, but all that to say, like, I want to really ensure that I differentiate it from other performance based contracts of the past, because I think that, you know, some of the people in this virtual room <laughs> might be familiar with you know, what that meant and how it kind of caused energy management providers to drive down comfort outcomes for residents. So, you know, we model out, this is how much we can save you. We take 25% of that. And then that's, you know, tabulated as a software as a service fee. But if we overachieve on savings, which in many cases we do in 2019, we achieved over 120% of our savings. Um, you keep all the extra cash. Like we're not going to come to you asking for more money. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Uh, thank you. These are great answers. So, uh, Ulta, also a question for all, you, you can unmute yourself, but do you see a path in Ontario for providing great grid services through management or of, uh, of behind the meter assets? So putting that forward to, to Alex Carter and, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's a question for all the three uh, companies. Their, their solutions are fantastic in reducing grid management or behind the meter uh, utility bills, but do they in Ontario, because Alex, I think mentioned that they're working in New York and I know also Peak Power is work, working in New York because of their regulatory regime. Is there a path to that business model in Ontario, at least in the near future that they see? I can uh, start with that. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, uh, you know, let's start with, say, like a, a bi-directional energy, like V to B or V to G um, kind of perspective, right? So if you're, if you're talking about bi-directional EV charging, um, more and more uh, groups, even in other jurisdictions like California and, uh, and, and like New York, they're, they're seeing that because of these regulatory challenges that you can still maximize the kind of the... Um, the energy savings and the, the cost savings from implementing what they call vehicle to building instead of vehicle to grid. And because it's behind the meter, um, you know, using say like a third party ledger system, like a blockchain or something like that, that you can allow energy trading within the building, um, you know, to optimize the cost savings without needing any regulatory changes, um, you know, uh, over the fence instead of behind the fence. So. Thanks. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, so in the interest of time, because our panelists have been waiting patiently through, through the demos, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today from, um, from Switch, Parity, and also Peak Power, I'd like to move on to the next uh, section. So uh, I'm, Olta, I'll pass it on to you to kind of take over the discussion and help, uh, help us uh, close out the event. Thank you, Julia. Uh, maybe we can uh, start by first again thanking the technology uh, partners that presented us the demos. It was really highly informative. Uh, for the real estate leader panel, I, it is my pleasure to welcome Hazel Satin, Director of Environmental Standards at BOMA, Joe Brown, Director of Building Technology at Kingset Capital, 
and Lee Hodgkinson, VP of Technical Services at Dream. Maybe we can start with the first question. We can start with Hazel, and then we can have the same question to our other, our other panelists. What are the main energy utility sustainability goals and strategies that you're currently implementing? And what role do you see PropTech playing in helping you meet those goals? Thank you, Ulta, and thank you for, for having me on this panel. Um, I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass, I'll, I'll let my, my, my fellow panelists uh, address the first one because I, I'm not personally um, managing a portfolio of buildings. And so what I, the insight that I can provide is really the, the, on the role of PropTech in helping building managers and owners achieve ESG goals. And what's been fascinating is that over the past, you know, te like technology isn't new in, in properties. Um, you know, we've had sensors for a long time. We've had real-time monitoring happening for a while now, but some of the challenges has really been associated with the amount of data uh, that's been um, presented to building managers and having to make sense of that data and having, you know, you need the expertise, you need the time, you just sit down and really decipher what that means to be able to glean those insights. And so I think what's really interesting about this new wave of prop tech is that with the AI component is that it's helping to actually intelligently assist the building owners and managers and investors to really understand the impacts, challenges, and opportunities of their building's operations. Um, so it's, it's proving to be a real tool, which is which is fantastic. And, you know, we've seen many of the examples today from our the, the wonderful uh, demos that were, were provided. And I think one of the pieces, um, and, and Phil alluded, you know, the conversation with Phil um, was really about this topic, was about the idea of it providing greater flexibility, so PropTech providing greater flexibility in operations and allowing for a more dynamic and responsive approach to building operations so that they can react uh, more nimbly to new scenarios. And just to quickly give a, a just a, a little story about the fact that um, HEC Montréal, which is um, at the business school in Montreal, their students were tasked with looking at real building data from uh, office buildings in downtown Montreal during COVID lockdown scenarios. So when occupant density had dropped way, way down and they were tasked with understanding what were the uh, predictors for building consumption for reduced uh, building consumption in the buildings and so of course there's an assumption that it would be number of building occupants but it wasn't in fact it was the availability availability of granular uh, of, uh, of being able to look at your building operations in a more granular way zone control sensors etc and so that really proved to be the the differentiating factor between predictability of whether or not a building would actually reduce its energy consumption during those periods and so what we're going to be doing at Bombast is actually pivoting so for our green building certification pivoting and not just asking about what is your actual consumption and, and give you points for that number anymore because what does benchmarking what does benchmarking of good performance look like now during COVID and so instead we're going to be asking about what strategies you, were you able to put in place what trends were you able to analyze between the two um, and I think that's really going to uh, and then we'll be looking at the and we'll be analyzing the data to see if we see similar um, similar insights from uh, from the, the 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 power that is prop tech uh, as we move forward. Navigating the sustainability reporting is a very diff uh, difficult field and I applaud you for the uh, good efforts that you're making in standardizing it in some form. Maybe we can pass the same question on to Joe. Uh, Joe, what are the main energy utility and sustainability goals and sustainability you're implementing and have you seen any role for prop tech in helping you meet those goals? Yeah, I, I think we are, are really taking another look at everything from a, a holistic uh, perspective. I think that's the big change that we've moved into in the last year or so. We're not looking at, uh, I think gone are the days of the, hey, let's reduce by three and 5%. It, it's more performance-based standards, science-based goals to, to help us hit our long-term goals. What do we need to do to get to where we want to be in 2030 and 2050? And let's build the plan to get there now. Um, Carbon-based uh, accounting as well, like, like energy tracking energy that's great but uh but we really need to track the metric that that we're really concerned about is, is which is carbon and energy and carbon are not the same things um and so we need to track what what we're trying to achieve so um that that's where we're trying to go but it, and how ai or prop tech will get us there is is pretty much it's embedded in everything um optimization like we're implementing AI uh, on existing buildings, trying to figure out how to optimize and, and get us uh, some more efficiencies out of our existing buildings. Um, measurement and verification, uh, putting things in from, from a tracking of an energy perspective, but a, again, another huge uh, 
thing that's come up uh, during COVID is, is the health of our spaces. So, so tracking how much our indoor air quality and then using that data and tying it back to um, BAS systems and whatnot to, to optimize and, and get it for energy efficiency. Because a lot of the things that we've done for COVID, the easy solution was just to turn off um, fixes that we put in BFDs. Let's just run these things wide open now, bring more fresh air into the building. And that, that makes it a healthier space, but at what cost? So getting efficiencies back in using technology, I think is, is a huge focus for us right now. Um, all of our capital plans, there's technology in everything. Um, we, we need to determine what to bring in, make sure that it's smart, make sure that it works well with all the other building systems. We have to look at things uh, in a more holistic view than we have in the past. It's not just a boiler retrofit anymore. It's, it's, we need a heating source and a cooling source. Sometimes that equipment might be the same thing and, and use some technologies that aren't as familiar as, uh, as traditional systems and buildings. Um, and then, and then on the development side, it, it's there as well, monitoring right through uh, construction and into final occupancy of the building. What is defined as, as what people want in a new build, uh, whether it be residential, which is primarily what we're dealing with at, at this point in time anyway, it's, there's a, a huge expectation of, of technology and that, that has to be in that space on day one to provide the user experience that, that is required. And, and that stuff drives efficiency. So it's kind of a, a nice place to be com for me because it gives me all of the, this shiny new stuff that takes me maybe a decade to get in an old building uh, on day one and lets me, lets me uh, play with it and, and drive these use cases out of them from, uh, from the very get-go. Absolutely. Uh, the role of uh, digital digitalization five years ago was to provide us data, and you made a very good distinction between AI and data right now. We have progress. We have actually made a huge leap in going into analyzing the data, and maybe sometimes we're overburdened with a lot of information, and AI helps us take the right decision based on very concrete information and data that we've aggregated in, uh, in a number of years, and that helps you make smarter decisions for new buildings that you're going to have or when you enter a new uh, new opportunities for retrofits. Um, th thank you very much for uh, that response. Maybe the last, uh, the same question goes for uh, Lee. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, uh, you know, following Hazel and Joe, it'll be hard not to repeat some of the great points that they've already made. I'll try my best, though. Um, you know, from Dream's perspective, you know, we have public KPIs on sustainability already. You know, I think it's 70% on waste diversion, 10% on energy GHG and water over the next five years. And we finished our five-year target, um, you know, in 2019. And we, so we set a new one. Um, but even these targets, which we set for five years looking forward, um, are evolving every day as we learn more and the technology becomes more available, especially prop tech. Um, and the market or the industry goal posts move for, further along. And, and I'm very supportive of that as well. Like we like a challenge and we want to challenge others to be better as well. Um, so, you know, net zero strategies are in development, you know, across stream to think about how do we go even further than just 10% here and 10% there. Uh, and we have specific sites such as Zippy in Ottawa, which is a really amazing community. And we have a you know ski hill in, in Colorado. They are all, uh, on their road to net zero within, um, I think, five years in one case and 10 years in the other case. Uh, and we've got, um, and, and so that's kind of what we're currently doing. Uh, in addition to that, renewable energy, which we haven't talked much about, is a big factor in decarbonization. And so, you know, we've got, you know, district thermal systems, whether we've built that or we've connected to others, and we've got uh, solar power in our portfolio already. And and we're planning on doing a lot more and, and you know, we're in development to, to, to think about what scale does that mean? And so, but coming back to like how prop tech can play a role, um, you know, I think there's kind of like a hardware component and like a software component. And, you know, we need hardware tech that can replace carbon intensive processes, whether that's, you know, heating or cooling or, or you know, the other things in HVAC or, or, you know, EV charging, things like that. We need more hardware tech there. And then on the software tech side, you know, we looked at prop tech to help us with data collection. You know, we look at having supervisory softwares, you know, I think, you know, Parity has mentioned this and Peak Power has mentioned this as well, where, you know, tracking and managing and then alarming, um, you know, deviations in that data, whether that's a 
a piece of equipment or whether that's, um, you know, energy. Uh, and, you know, from my, like, you know, I got like 13 years of energy management experience, you know, after you do a retrofit, you know, everybody has sees this nice little graph, you know, Oh, you used to be here and now you're down here and it's great. Right. Um, but what happens is it creeps back up over time. And so prop tech can play a huge role in, you know, telling you and keeping that savings that you've assumed you're going to get, uh, and tracking that performance. And I really think that performance business models, you know, parity alluded to this for sure. And, and SaaS are really great ways to keep the vendors at the table, uh, and, you know, have them with skin in the game, if you will. And I think prop tech is, um, unique to, you know, a property like to our business models in that sense, because we didn't traditionally have vendors that were willing to stay in our buildings long-term. That is a very important problem that uh, building managers used to have. And I think you alluded to that, that performance guarantee and that long-term relationship with vendors and creating a sticky relationship. It's very important in this uh, space. I cannot believe how good we've made with time considering the very restricted timelines that we have. This last question is a very fast question for uh, each of our panelists. And maybe if you can keep it as brief as possible, one or two sentences. What are some of the key decisions that landlords or owners should start making today in order to move in the right direction towards sustainability? And because we left you for lastly, maybe if you'd like to start first and just give us those uh, two or three aspects or decisions. Yeah, keeping it quick. Um, I encourage all landlords and owners try a bunch of different things. There's so many technologies these days. I think prop tech, what, one thing I really love about it is just like with uh, Microsoft Office, if you don't like it, you unsubscribe. You know what I mean? Like you can pick and choose which vendors can play a role month to month, day to day, whatever that looks like. Um, try lots of different things. Think, find out what works for you and grab a bunch of the things that work really, really well and, and force them to talk to each other. Like I think Alex kind of alluded to um, with parity, you know, integrations and stuff like that. Like we, you know, we do feel like we have power to um, vote with our dollars on which vendors should talk to each other and, and create value. That's a fantastic advice. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Maybe uh, passing it on to Hazel. Same yeah, great. question. Thank you. Yes, um, I think uh, COVID provides a really interesting point, uh, moment in time to really have this like amazing case study of how did your building react and then understanding where you didn't get the information that you where would you like to have seen more information? And so that can be a gap that PropTech might be able to fill. Um, and so to, to investigate those particular solutions that I, I have to shamelessly plug the fact that BOMA Best, uh, sustain, or BOMA Best Smart Building certification was just launched in pilot uh, last week. And both Dream and Kingset uh, Capital are, are at the table. Dream even has a building. Thank you, Lee Hodgkinson and your team for putting a, a building through the pilot. Um, and that's going to pro provide basically a pathway to identifying how to continuously improve your building on this path towards having a more intelligent and decarbonized building moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hazel. Lee, the same, uh, sorry, Joe, the same question for you. Yeah, I think I would suggest just having a high level vision, uh, getting that in order, and and then just pick your pick your tech to to formalize that vision. Um, ideally, you have some procurement policies and things like that in place, so you pick tech that plays well with each other and, and it's not going to open up cybersecurity holes and all that that fun stuff. But it's good to have that in order very uh, early in the process as well. But I mean. Um, you, you need to know where you want to go and get that high level buy-in and then you can pick and choose. I think there's a, there's a ton of prop tech out there that can get you to where you want to be. So yeah, that, that's where I, I would um, focus at this point. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Joe. And thank you all the panelists and Ulta for joining us today. I think in the interest of time, I can't believe we squeezed this all in in one hour. Thank you everyone for joining us. So um, again, I would love to, to ask the audience to please submit your feedback for the PropTex in the survey and also join us as a consider joining PropTech Collective as an official supporter to stay on top of our upcoming events and industry news. We do put on these events on a quarterly basis and also have a monthly newsletter where you can stay on top of everything that's happening in the PropTech. Um, but yes, and with 20 seconds to spare until we meet again, please stay safe and don't hesitate to reach out if we can be helpful to your journeys. Um, thank you again to everyone on behalf of PropTech Collective, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.